last week we talked about how the time is right for people to hear more about Jesus. And today I'd like for us to think about some of what we can tell them. The most basic Christian belief is that when we die, we will have eternal life in heaven. But there's another Christian belief that goes along with that, one that is several, seldom talked about. It is the belief that even today, we are already citizens of heaven. The Bible tells us heaven is where we belong, it's where our true home is, it's where our citizenship is. Paul says that we are citizens in heaven and only expatriates here on earth. An expatriate is someone who lives in a foreign country. And so we are here living in a foreign country. So we should see ourselves as foreigners in the world, foreigners on earth. This is not our home. Our home is somewhere else. Another way the Bible expresses that is to say that we are sojourners on earth. That means we are on a journey through here. This is not where we belong. This is not where we're going to stay. We're only here temporarily passing through on our way to somewhere else. And so we're farmers here. Passing through on our way to where we really belong. We're just here temporarily. If you look at it that way, it puts our lives on earth, our life here today, in a different perspective. We're just passing through. We're really not a part of what's going on in the world around us. We're really not a part of the world at all. We're just passing through. And this thing is found throughout the New Testament. In fact, it is one of the main things that permeates the entire New Testament. The New Testament speaks many times about the world. And it's important to realize when the New Testament is speaking of the world, it is not speaking of the planet Earth. It's speaking of the entire cosmos. And when the New Testament speaks of the world, it's not speaking of the centers of the world. It's not speaking of the back alley of crime, the back alley of corruption things like that. It's speaking about everything. And surprisingly enough, even though the Bible tells us that God created the world, the New Testament views the world very negatively. And that starts off early in the Gospels when Jesus is in the wilderness and Satan tempts him. One of the temptations Jesus is that Satan offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. And that's the first hint that we have, that the world is evil in the New Testament. It centers around Satan. Now that may not be today what a lot of Christians believe, but that's how the New Testament does in fact present it. The book of 1 John says it directly. The whole world, remember that's the whole universe, the universe lies under the sway of the wicked one. In John chapter 12, Jesus said, the prince of the world shall be cast out. He's talking about Satan. The prince of the universe. A prince is a ruler. One who has power. The New Testament views the entire universe. That's the entire universe. It's also all of human society. All of human society. Not just the back out of human society. All of human society lies under the control of the devil. And that's the reason the world is talked about so negatively in the New Testament. That's why Jesus told his disciples, you are not of the world. You are not under the control of Satan. And Jesus said, because of that, they will hate you just like they hate me. 
This negative view of the world is found in other places. In 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks of the things of the world as being foolish, base. He says the wisdom of the world is foolishness. Again, he's not talking about the wisdom of back alley crime and pornography and all that mess. He's talking about the wisdom of the world is foolish. Paul speaks of the world being condemned. He speaks of the vices of the world. He speaks of the God of this world that is Satan as blinded people. He says the world is evil. He criticizes people who love the ways of the world. He advises people not to walk in the ways of the world. He tells people not to be conformed to the world. And like I said, when we hear stuff like this, we think he's talking about the back alley stuff, the drug dealing, the pornography, the child sex molestation rings, and all stuff like that. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about the world. Oh no. He's talking about it all. The wisdom of the world. The ways of the world. Not the back alley stuff. Not the back alley wisdom of sinners but the wisdom of the world. The book of James says, he who is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. The book of 1 Peter speaks of the corruption of the world, the pollution of the world. The book of 1 John speaks against people who promote false Christian doctrine. And the author says they are not of God, they are of the world. The book of Revelation speaks about how Satan deceives the whole world the whole world, not just the evil people, not just the people we don't like and people we don't agree with, but Satan deceives the whole world. And these are just a few examples. This thing runs throughout the New Testament. The entire world, the entire universe, all of human society is seen as being under the control of Satan. And Christians are told to separate. And that is the true meaning of the word church that we find in the Bible. The church doesn't refer to a building or organization or where you go on Sunday. The church literally is a word that means those who are called out. Called out to separate themselves from the world. We are called to separate ourselves from the world, from the ways of the world. In the parable of the sower, remember where the sower goes out and sows the seeds. Some of them get picked up by the birds. Some of them get come up with their own rocky ground and they don't last long. And some of them come up and get choked out by the weeds. Jesus describes the weeds as the cares of the world. And so throughout the New Testament, the world is seen negatively. It's essential to realize that nowhere in the New Testament does it ever tell us that the world is going to change. Nowhere does it picture the world turning from Satan to God. Nowhere does it say that Christians can go out and work and turn the world around and make it better. Nowhere does it say that Christians are going to go out and change society. It never even mentions changing society. Changing society back then was not even thought possible because the world is under control of the devil. The New Testament sees things getting worse as time goes on. They get more and more under the control of the devil. That's what happens. They get worse. In fact, traditional Christian belief has it that that's what precipitates the second coming of Jesus. That things just keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse and they're getting so bad that things would collapse. And so Jesus returns because if he doesn't, things are just going to collapse. Now we talked last week about deaths of despair. How it is a pandemic among younger, middle class, white men who are dying from suicide drug overdose, and alcohol abuse. We talked about how people 
get so down and out about the way things are going now for their lives that they just give up. What can we do about that? Well, I guarantee you we're not going to change the way things are. We're not going to re-engineer society and make it more friendly to younger, working-class white men. We're not going to help the situations that are making deaths of despair so numerous now. We're not going to make conditions any better. You might as well forget about that. They're just going to get worse. So what do we have to offer? The only thing we do have to offer is the promise of Christianity. We can tell them, look, Christianity predicts exactly what you're going through. Not only for you, but it's going to spread to many other groups of people, too. And what Christianity tells us to do is realize we've got to pull ourselves out of it. We've got to detach ourselves out of it. We're not part of it. We don't belong to it. We belong somewhere else. In our gospel reading, we heard Jesus tell Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And literally, that is, my kingdom is not of this universe. As Christians, we are part of Jesus' kingdom. And that kingdom is not of this universe, so therefore we are not of this universe. We are part of a different universe. That's something that Christians don't talk much about today. Christians today will go out and feed the hungry and clothe the naked and all the granted. Those are things Jesus said to do. However, even when we do stuff like that, we have to remember that we are not a part of this universe. We are a part of a different world. There's another aspect to all this. A long time ago we talked about the New Testament concept of truth. And we saw that that's a Greek word that has the connotation of an uncovering, like something is covered up and we take the cover off. That's the New Testament conception of truth. And it carries with it the connotation that things are not the way they appear to be. In fact, it carries with it the connotation that the way things appear to be is misleading and deceptive. The way things appear to be hides the truth, the way things really are. In the New Testament sense, truth connotes pulling away a covering to reveal what is actually there. Reality, then, is not the way it seems. Appearances are not reality. Reality is hidden behind appearance. The world only goes on appearances. And that's why the world does not and will never have truth. And when you look at it that way, that appearances hide reality. And that is true in everything. It's obvious that what we can tell people is that we are part of something far greater than what is around us. We are part of something far greater than the universe here. There is much to things that we do not know. In fact, what we know is misleading because what we know is derived from appearance. And remember, appearance distorts reality. Reality is hidden behind experience, opinion. A long time ago, we talked in here about consciousness. Consciousness is our sense that we exist. If we are conscious, we are aware of our surroundings. We are aware that we are an individual separate and distinct from other things. We are capable of sensing and responding to the world around us. Consciousness also includes feelings like love, emotion, sadness, happiness immaterial things like that. Scientists do not know what creates consciousness. They do not know how to even define consciousness. They do not understand how it works. 
And you know, neither can scientists describe and define life. They can recognize certain life processes going on in an organism and say that organism is alive because it has these processes going on. But they do not know what sparks and sustains those life processes. They can mix all the ingredients of life into a container, but yet life will not emerge. And so they do not really know what life is. Now add to that, back years ago when we talked about consciousness, we talked about the possibility, just the possibility, that all of we think of as reality, including the physical world and our own human bodies, is a projection of our consciousness. We talked about the idea that consciousness is really what life is. And then from there springs the projection of reality. And we talk about the possibility that what we see around us is a projection of our consciousness, a construct inside our minds. That our consciousness is not only independent of the physical universe, our consciousness made the physical universe as a construct. Now back then when I talked about that, it may seem like that I was going way out in the field somewhere and talking about some weirdo thing that doesn't matter. But what I was trying to do with that is illustrate the Christian idea that true reality is not found in appearances. True reality is not found in what we see around us. What we see around us is a distortion of true reality. That means that the world around us, including our own physical bodies, is a distortion of true reality. And maybe that's the reason Christianity tells us not to get attached to the world. It tells us that we're not part of the world. Maybe what we see is a distortion. Maybe we are just sojourners here in this virtual reality experience of life. See, there's got to be a sense of wonder in the way we look at life. When I was a kid, one of the favorite things I liked to do at the beach was to go out on the beach at night. And it would be dark out there on the beach. That was before the beach was like the Las Vegas Strip. You know, that was back when it was actually dark at the beach at night. Go out on the beach at night and I'd stand there and I'd look over the and you know, you'd see the waves, at night you couldn't really see anything but the white passes that start breaking pain. You'd hear the noise and you could see it was just going as far as you could see. And maybe the moon would be out a little bit and you could see it rippling on the water. And I'd stand there on the beach at night. I love to do that and just look out over there. I wondered what in the world is on the other side of the map. It was such a vast expanse of dark ocean. It was so mysterious. What's over there? And I could just stand there and just look out over that beach. And I remember the first time when I actually crossed that ocean. The first time I went to Europe and I landed. And I thought, this is what's over here. And it was really more wonderful than I ever imagined it would be over there. Now, you know, maybe today, we need to transmit to people that in our lives today, we need to have more of an attitude like we're standing on the beach at night looking over there and wondering what's beyond. Wondering what's on the other side. We have this big, vast expanse of water in front of us and we have a sense of wonder like a child standing there wondering what's on the other side of that water. It's a mystery. And maybe we need to recover a sense of wonder and mystery about what true reality really is. And so maybe the message that we have that we can give to people called in despair, we need to say, look at life. It's standing on the beach at night and 
we've got to help people regain that sense of mystery and that sense of wonder at what lies beyond. We've got to help them take their lives off of just looking down all the time and look out over there and wonder what lies beyond. Because you see, one day we're going to go what lies beyond. And we need to have a sense of wonder and mystery about that. There's a big disagreement between ancient people and modern people. Ancient people say there is much more to things than we can see. Ancient people say there's much going, there's much more going on than we can ever understand. Modern people on the other hand say we see all there is. We understand all there is. And let's go back to our example of standing on the beach at night looking out. Think about the beach. And think about the sand on the beach. And think about one little grain of sand right out there on the beach. You know, they tell us that our universe that we live in is incredibly fast. Nobody knows how fast it is. But they tell us that either Earth it's just like a grain of sand in the universe. It's so big. Now think of a grain of sand laying out on the beach. And that grain of sand is laying out. If that grain of sand is laying out on the beach, he's saying, I see it all. I understand it all. Has that grain of sand ever seen the Smoky Mountain? Has that grain of sand ever seen Kansas or Oklahoma or Wyoming or New Mexico or California or Alaska or Hawaii? It's laying on the sand in South Carolina. It thinks it's seen it all. It thinks it knows it all. That's modern people today. That's science for you. We're sitting a grain of speck of sand in one little corner of the universe and we think we know it all. We understand it all. You see how we've lost that sense of mystery and wonder? We know it all. God doesn't exist. Why not? Well, because I understand the whole universe. Isn't that the way they do? It's demonic. Remember how we heard the wisdom of the world is foolishness. Jesus said this, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But narrow is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And there will be few that find it. I remember a song from back years ago. I've remembered this song all my life. Of course, I remember a lot of it. It said, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The Apostle Paul wrote, Eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, nor have entered into the hearts of man the things God has prepared for those who love him. This is the message people in despair need to hear. And this is the message of Christianity.